Nightfall, a 2016 visual art workshop based around the Isle of Sark, gave young artists and designers the opportunity to experiment and make new work in reaction to the dark sky environment. The retreat, supported by the European Academy of Art in Brittany and subsequent exhibition at the UBO, inspired new collective research methodologies, site-specific actions, and innovative forms of documentation and translation. Participants updated and expanded on the nocturne tradition in visual art by engaging with the body's physical experiences of the dark in media, including photography, drawing, video, sculpture, ready-mades, and sound art. The variety of formal and conceptual approaches can serve as a resource for academics seeking to engage with and popularize notions from night studies among non-academic audiences. Likewise, introducing visual practitioners to concepts such as light pollution, nocturnal soundscapes, and dark ecological networks can promote art science collaboration, encourage makers to engage with natural phenomena, and to internalize the environmental externalities inherent in various creative processes. During the workshop, participants traveled together from Saint Malo to Guernsey to Sark and back by sea. The workshop encouraged immersion in light and sound environments uncommon for urban dwellers. Artists explored their artistic practices in relation to the uses of electricity, artificial lighting, and natural resources. Art about and at night is a means to understand and guide social behaviors, both at night and during the day. Briefly analyzing contemporary initiatives regarding night art can help situate the works produced during nightfall, the workshop within various larger movements. Most art historical writing on the subject of nocturnes, painted representations of the night in 18th century Europe and the late 19th century US, uh, however, beyond such traditional representations, their workshop evoked relevant artworks with a critical attitude to environmental and cultural changes in how we appreciate the night. Recent exhibitions position night art in the nocturne tradition and or affirm a socially engaged view of night as a time for political action or individual representation. Notably, the last uh, poster here is from Peindre la Nuit at the Centre Pompidou du Metz, which explored representational and critical art at night through the lens of three revolutions, the spread of electricity, psychoanalysis, the inner night, and the conquest of space through modern astrophysics, which were linked to three types of vertigo, sensory confusion, inner vertigo of dreams, and cosmic vertigo. In contemporary art, annual white night events, so monthly nighttime art events, architectural mapping projections, and the spe spectacular lighting of monuments and heritage sites can also be seen as a conquest of the night. These efforts often look to promote societal cohesion and peaceful coexistence by creating spaces for different publics to gather and experience artworks together. Whereas critical art questions the underlying unity of different groups that constitute the public, by asking what its members have in common and provoking debate, nighttime art events, festivals, rituals, bring members of the community together around common experiences, emphasizing unity rather than divisions. So I'm gonna tell you a bit about the workshop itself. The nightfall workshop provided a means to explore and address night art outside of the physical and temporal constraints of a traditional teaching environment. Contrary to initial intentions, only a minority of the works produced were actively made on site due to logistical, temporal, material, financial constraints. And instead, the workshop evolved into a research style residency period for intense reflection that laid the groundwork for subsequent production. The workshop involved fine arts, graphic design and industrial design, third year undergraduates to fifth year master's candidates from all four of ASAP's campuses in Lorient, Quimper, Brest and Rennes, and was the first boat retreat to insist on such geographic heterogeneity. The experience blurred the lines between daily life and art making, between public and private spheres. Everyone lived and worked in a shared close quarters with rare moments of isolation. Opportunities to bathe were limited and during the crossing of the English Channel, almost every participant 
experience severe seasickness, a very visceral reminder of how our physical environment influenced proprioception and our capacity for higher level functioning. The, some, the sentiment that no one was immune to an experience that would otherwise be a private affair increased empathy, uniting participants in their resolve to help each other. The mobile physical environment depends on unpredictable rhythms of the sea, the wind, currents, waves, etc. Certain sites, including clay caves near Dixcart Bay, uh, where the boat was anchored in Sark, were unexpectedly rendered completely inaccessible over the course of one 12 hour day due to rising tides. The necessity to travel everywhere on site, on the island, on foot, created an embodied learning experience. Students could only use what they could physically carry in the time allotted, making travel and transport an integral dimension of each art project rather than a supply chain problem for someone else to solve. The journey to and from the island was just as important as the time on site. The theme of the workshop night became a beacon driving daytime experiences, inverting a common temporal organization where night bookends a day well spent. Instead of looking to light up the night by extending daytime modes of seeing, participants searched the sites on Sark that would be particularly evocative at night during the day. The workshop featured various pedagogical strategies. Few ground rules were set in advance. Instead, schedules evolved in an organic manner with moments set aside for collective reflection and brainstorming. There was no imposed time frame for project completion and the choice of materials and working methods was left entirely up to each artist. Though initial research primarily, primarily involved on-site documentation through photography, uh, video documentation, recordings, and note taking. I took on the role of a facilitator and a participant as well, eventually making work presented alongside that of students and collaborative decision-making processes, guided day-to-day -day life, on-island research, and ultimately decisions about the subsequent exhibitions, title, communications, marketing, and schedule. Next, I'm going to talk a bit about the artworks that were made. After the retreat, students were to return to their respective campuses to make and refine finished artworks. Different strategies were embraced by participants. The image on the slide is actually from a work that one of the works that was produced on site. Um, different strategies were embraced embraced by participants, ranging from representing to interacting with to recreating elements of the trip and the nighttime environment. Half the participants chose to work with digital media while half used traditional media, mainly sculpture and installation. Of the pieces produced, half alluded to the experience of night on sea while the rest referred to night on the island. The workshop featured an open choice of materials and techniques, but transportation issues pose technical limits for works on site. Temporary works were produced on island with locally available natural materials, sticks, stone, sand, and white water-based paint purchased off-site. Artists brought back materials from Sark for later use, sand, salt water, dirt samples, plastic debris, and a sub later provided um, students with plaster, flower nets, ropes, and audiovisual equipment and covered the cost of transport. Uh, finished works, the final exhibition. The experience prompted a reconsideration of familiar modes of making. Night gives a new dimension to common materials and invites different perceptions of them. La Borse Couché imagined the sand around the island as a crumbly scholar bed, both welcoming and frustrating potential sleepers. The loss of points of reference changes our relationships to scale and making it difficult to judge relative distances between objects close by and far away. Ponds' archipels, Renault's crowd, and Kuyum Jian's drawings based on portal land charts evoke this experience of disorientation at sea and at night as travelers grasp at familiar forms to make sense of their moving environments. The sensory deprivations and altered rhythms of the night heighten our awareness of the social dimension in making and consuming art. Night both reinforces physical isolation and invites wonder and camaraderie among humans. Uh, night connects connotes a variety of distinctive moments, uh, solitude, and liminal states. The works produced in the workshop rarely evoked a revelry and were more somber in nature, even though the workshop includes many collective meals, discussions, and moments for collaboration. Dreaming, the unconscious, and sleeping have long inspired art making, and historically this connection was particularly important for the surrealists and within various mystical traditions and ancient cultures. And it's visible in some of the works that we have looked at. 
of the larger questions asked by the workshop was how can we dream together? The collective dream as a metaphor, a vision for social change. And unlike nocturnes in visual art, night as a subject matter in the performing arts concept, context inspires individual laments and above all collective experiences. The workshop asked whether the theatrical tradition can be transposed into contemporary art with its more individualistic, less socially engaged visual art tradition at night. How can darkness manifest in art become what Jean-Marie Gallet describes as a seat of political resistance? So next I'm going to describe the exhibition a bit. Uh, so our curator objective, uh, curatorial objective was to continue to promote collective decision-making as the show came together. First work that viewers encountered was Marion Rousseau's recreation, low-tech recreation of aspects of the boat experience. And the U exhibition was also an opportunity for institutional resource exchange between the UBO and the four ASAP campuses. And it led to a significant partnership, uh, which was the establishment of a three-year undergraduate degree course in, in interdisciplinary arts between the two institutions and many subsequent graduating student shows in the space. It also featured an active staging. So people, instead of having a structure where there was an opening at the beginning of the show, and then this the same uh, works can be seen throughout the show, uh, the works actually evolved over time with many being produced at moments when visitors were present in at the space. So by integrating the production and installation of the show into the exhibition, Nightfall invited guests to experience the art as a process and to think about the conditions under which the works were made. So I want to talk a bit about the outcomes and um, the results of this workshop. Explicitly defining the night as an object of artistic research and supporting work that addresses this theme can promote artistic production that is spatially and temporally aware. This awareness manifests in specific material choices, formal and symbolic considerations, types of audience interactions and new opportunities for interdisciplinary action for knowledge growth, consciousness raising and social engagement. The workshop led to specific outcomes in the short and long-term impacting the creative trajectories of leaders and students alike. In general, night art brings specific tools, methods and ideas to the night studies table and the working methods of nightfall can serve as models for collective action by a brainstorming production and communication. The themes addressed by the artwork included sensory deprivation, mapping, displacement, waste, scale, starlight, natural rhythms and tides, sleep and sleeplessness, hydration and fire electricity in night. Dismissing the passive forms of entertainment favored by certain big budget art events, the workshop supported creative research that asked open-ended questions inviting aesthetic and intellectual engagement with the night sky. The vast majority of art at night programming includes commercial gallery night events, free public festivals and paid spectacles such as concerts or Burning Man that invite the public to unwind and revel. However, for philosopher Joas Zask, real participation requires a critical social and political stance regarding our own norms and habits. Night art lends itself to inquiry rather than diversion, ultimately enabling action rather than entertainment. Finally, the workshop promoted the use of new technological and digital tools in the service of nature and all people, rather than for the accumulation of privately held capital, insisting on the night as a time to observe, explore, create, and regenerate with a DIY ethos. The workshop countered overarching tendencies towards bioderegulation, which Teresa Brennan describes as the technologization and financialization of human time, especially sleep as productive labor. The sensory night experiences offered were translated for the public at large and shared through their artworks. According to Samuel Sharia, Culture can be a means to overcome the technologization of dark ecological networks by inviting the public to become stakeholders and to claim ownership over the importance of the night. Collaborating with visual artists can be a way for academics focused on night studies to reach new audiences and to use technologies developed for military data collection and analytic objectives in a way that brings people together to reflect on and protect our precious natural resources in the night sky. Thank you for your attention.
and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have at the end of the presentations. Thank you, Kazia. Um, I think we're going to hold the questions till after everyone spoke, okay. if that's okay. Um, so then I'm going to go straight in and introduce Nick Dunn. Um, Nick is, of course, from Lancaster University. And he wasn't here for the recording of Nicholas's uh, presentation earlier, but Nicholas quoted uh, Nick in his piece, uh, his book, uh, Dark Matters. So let me introduce Nick, and you're going to speak about nocturnal urban natures. It's all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Right. I'll just get this going, everybody. There we go. So, um, Thanks. Great to be here today. Uh, thank you, Claire, for the introduction, and to Manuel and Jordi and the conference team for the opportunity to talk to you. So the pandemic city has been subject to multiple forms of reorganisation through all kinds of temporal scales, enforced lockdown, restriction and curfew. And lots of headlines have been generated in relation to how different cities are, especially at night when they're emptied out of their usual urban bus, you know, that those rhythms that we're so familiar with. And as a result, numerous cities around the world have been quieter, cleaner and calmer. This lack of people, traffic, the urban choreographies that we normally find in a busy city centre have led to greater attention being possible upon those aspects of the city that are perhaps more pronounced. And I, I talk about this in my paper in the conference as a presence within absence. You know, the idea that particular forms of labor that normally would operate in the background, supporting the city with its vital services of maintenance, repair, um, or responding to the fluctuating demands of citizens through gig economy work are suddenly much more explicit because many other people are no longer accessing the urban night. And in addition, perhaps on the flip side of that, in places of urban nature close to the city, which normally would have people in them, um, are much less visited by humans during lockdown and restrictions. And that's meant that previously barely detectable presences of non-humans have become more prominent um, through the reduction of anthropogenic activity. So, throughout the three national lockdowns here in the UK, I continued my practice of night walking in my home city of Manchester to try and understand how these different measures were, Im were impacting upon the city at night. And during the second national lockdown between the 5th of November uh, to the 2nd of December 2020, I conducted 12 night walks around and through the city centre. And the absence of the usual nighttime business and people was palpable. You know, instead, you know, it was possible to experience occasional pockets of activity that would appear and then fade, all the more curious and kind of conspicuous without the usual background hum and thrum of the city at night. The multiple uneven distribution of darkness across an urban landscape at night often offers cover for the latent subcultural and marginalized to be manifest in ways that are distinctly different from the quotidian routines and confines of the daytime. Let's be honest, people are able to move around differently at night, perhaps under less scrutiny than during daily hours and outside perhaps of their roles and responsibilities that they may be committed to in the daytime. But when you transpose this to a situation of the pandemic city, where there is a heightened presence of absence, these nocturnal urban conditions offer a distinctive spatio-temporality perhaps that can reveal insightful yet often hidden rhythms, interactions, geographies and patterns of the city at night. The pandemic has undoubtedly changed the ways in which we relate to one another and interact with the places we live, work and play. Yet even pre-pandemic, I contend that the city after dark is always in a process of becoming, with nocturnal urban places providing spaces of possibility. And in this manner, I think night walking can contribute to the ways we might rethink how to undertake sensory ethnography, and maybe even support more than human participatory approaches. Night redefines the framework of thought and of action, 
providing a fertile realm for the imaginary, the speculative, territorial planning, and the practice of landscape. It also raises critical issues in relation to the multiplicities of night, in particular ideas of safety and security, and to understand how we might deconstruct the fears associated with urban darkness to provide alternative and empowering experiences of the city. And that's something that Salome Vinson was talking about this conference last year. During the periods of lockdown, as I mentioned earlier, a quieter, calmer and cleaner city has often emerged, being as it is far less populated by humans. Although such a city may have attractive qualities, it can also resonate with dystopian ideas where people are no longer a dominant characteristic of what makes a city. And that idea, of course, people disappearing, has been central to numerous works of fiction where a pandemic has devastated the human population. So it's perhaps unsurprising we find scenes such as this as maybe uncanny, possibly even frightening. But I think it also represents an opportunity to pay attention to those aspects of the city that are often relegated to the background. And this is something that Claire has been looking at too in her work with urban darkness as a design tool. So although I was fortunate enough to have a series of brief exchanges with bicycle couriers, cooks, drivers, health workers, security guards, street cleaners, and other service providers whilst conducting my field work, the restrictions on social activity combined with genuine concerns about COVID-19, bearing in mind we hadn't, no one had been vaccinated really by this point, meant that these remained informal and undocumented. But my conversations with a number of different people working through the night during this period did suggest that the different dynamics of the city after dark enabled them to produce a different kind of mental map than was possible before the pandemic when the urban night was much busier, especially in the city centre. Now, if we're going to really go for this, we need more robust evidence rather than, you know, anecdotal accounts from people such as myself to substantiate this. But I do think it points towards an increasingly urgent matter. And that's about labour conditions, which for a large amount of night work are frequently connected to dimensions of low socioeconomic status, including poor pay, precarious work, and the impacts upon health that result both directly and indirectly from having to work after dark. So by understanding how nightscapes are used differently by various people, the work I'm talking about briefly here and much more uh, extensively in the paper presents an initial exploration into what I think is much needed research that might usefully challenge existing approaches to designing for the city at night. I think this is of critical importance if we are to recognize the multiplicities of experience that together compose the urban night and provide us with the ability to rethink and reclaim it as a time and space that considers accessibility, inclusivity and equality. As the character of places reemerge pandemic, uh, you know, post pandemic rather, in different ways and at different speeds. I think the nocturnal city can be supported through an ongoing process that adopts a more temporarily sensitive approach to urban planning and design. So, this graveyard was where some bicycle couriers were able to take brief respite, whereas pre pandemic that wasn't possible because younger people were hanging out in this space. <clears throat> During the third national lockdown, I conducted a further eight night walks between the 3rd of February and the 29th of March, 2021, along the first two kilometer stretch of the Irk Valley nearest to the city center. And the rationale for choosing this, the Irk Valley is, is a huge kind of site, a uh, green corridor that runs from the center of the, of the city. But this bit in particular is very much neglected and at least on first appearances, is unremarkable in terms of its um, biodiversity. Compared to other sites within the Irk Valley that have significant biodiversity and are established and protected, this section is very much in flux. Um, 
but this part, this section of the Irk Valley also forms part of a major regeneration strategy, the Northern Gateway 2017 Master Plan. So for me, documenting its current status is even more relevant before it undergoes this significant change. Encountering this section of the Irk Valley at any time of day, it's, it's pretty hard to ignore the qualities that suggest a place to quickly move through rather than spend any time. Flora is overgrown, the surroundings are strewn with litter, there's unmanaged coppices, burnt out vehicles, and abandoned domestic and trade waste occupies multiple sites. But despite there being an increasing demand for acknowledgement that such untamed natures exist and can maybe even add value and dare I say, have a right to the city, their qualities um, upon encounter can often provoke dismissive, derogatory or even hostile responses from humans. They are rarely considered at night in research outside issues pertaining to safety and security. And a lot of current practice in terms of urban design and management tends to ignore such places until it becomes profitable for them to be regenerated. And that's a process, of course, that will have ecological consequences, good or bad, depending on the new scheme and what, what is planned. So I'm suggesting here that it, it's useful for us to turn our attention and open up sensitivities to those elements that are often underrepresented or excluded from design. And in the paper, I talk about a, a pandemic nocturnal practice, a mixed methods approach of night walking, autoethnography and photography, um, through which I've tried to conduct some initial investigations into ways through which we might document and communicate the underrepresented and marginalized places of the pandemic city after dark as a means to maybe rethink how we might design for a wider array of needs and behaviours, human and of course, non-human. So last slide now. Um, through this inquiry so far, and it's ongoing, I've tried to demonstrate how the different qualities of places after dark in the city of Manchester during lockdown present significantly different experiences than pre-pandemic. It's also my belief that within these shadow lands, perhaps just the glimpses of the future city might be detected. By presenting us with a preview of the nocturnal city that is less enthralled to the non-stop, always on culture that has pervaded contemporary urban life and stretch the consumer driven aspects of the daytime deep into the night, if not completely around the clock. This work has illustrated that when the dynamics of human movement and occupation are profoundly altered, a different nocturnal city is revealed that might offer signals for thinking through a multi-species urbanism that is also more human, ironically perhaps, in its shift towards inclusivity and equality. Thank you. Okay, so um, next we have Nicola Ouell, who's going to talk to us about nocturnal ambience in representation of pedagogy of darkness. Nicholas, it's for you. Thanks a lot. I will share my screen. So just here. So can you see it? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, so thank you, Claire. Thank you, Manuel. I am Nicola Well. I have a PhD in urban planning in North France. And today I'm going to present an educational workshop entitled Nocturnal Atmospheres in Representation. This workshop aimed to identify the places of the place of nocturnal space time in the educational program of architecture and design students in France and to offer to the students an introduction to the issues and method of designing a project for nocturnal ambiences. So we ask three questions. How to discuss nighttime space in architecture and design studies in France? How do architecture and design students deal with nighttime space in a design project? And how could we bring the notion of nighttime space into architecture and design studies still in France? So this workshop was a workshop 
on the design of nighttime ambiences in Nantes, France, in March 2019, during 10 days and 10 nights. The workshop was on the field and in class with eight students in higher education from Design School of Nantes Atlantic and Architecture School of Nantes. And then the purpose was how to reduce the light and rediscover the darkness. Rediscover the darkness is something historical. In uh, the 18th century, uh, Roger Ekic quotes um, William Hazlitt and Elbridge Colby with this sentence. You must create little errands, as if by accident, to send him in the dark, but such as can take up but little time and increase the length of time by degrees as you find his courage increase. So little errands in the dark, on the field, at night. This is one of the main purpose of this workshop. But how to introduce the subject of nighttime ambiences to students? We took three of the main topics of contemporary nighttime design, which is energy. In, in France, 12% of the electricity consumption is dedicated to street lighting. The topic of the ecology, which is international with the light pollution, the impact on biodiversity and on human health, and then the topic of the society, the individual and collective cultural representation of artificial lighting and darkness here in France, for example. We did this workshop in three steps. The first is the urban analysis. The students go on the field and observe the street lighting, the urban fabric, the spatial coverage of vegetation, for example, or the presence of water, and they gather physical indicators. Then the second step is the sensitive analysis. They go on the field to feel individual and collective perception, the feeling of well-being, the accessibility, the animation, the tranquility of the place they chose, and they gather sensitive indicators. From both physical and sensitive indicators, they started to customize the design of the nighttime ambiances with regard to these indicators to do what we called the contextualized atmospheres. So we will go through the three steps and we will try to understand how the students are understanding the topics of nighttime, the topic of nighttime ambiances. The first is the urban analysis. Each group used uh, two tools we provided to them, a density tool, um, a heat map tool with the density of the energy of street lighting in Nantes and a nocturnal pictures, aerial photography of Nantes, on which we can see or analyze a bit of the light pollution of the city. Then the first mission was to find a place with these two maps in the metropolis of Nantes without artificial lighting, and then go and explore it at night. So we have here the presentation of the fourth group, which we will go through now. The first group used the energy and density mapping and then did a sound mapping, a photographic survey and a freehand map. We can see here they took pictures at night on at day and they found their seat here while trying to find where there is no street lighting. It's around here. And then to understand the geometry of the place, they drew a freehand map. The second group also used photographic survey and then did a zoning of activities and a zoning of octonal, nocturnal human occupation. Here we can see that this group chose a place with artificial lighting. We didn't want to stop them and wanted to see how they would work with this kind of place, which is a bit aside of the subject. The third group also did a photographic survey, then a past and future studies of the place, a freehand map, and an observation of the light pollution on energy consumption here. 
it is very difficult on this really dense urban place to find places without artificial lighting. So we allowed students to choose place with kind of darkness with a low level of street lighting. Then the fourth group also did a photographic survey, an observation of nocturnal atmospheres, and some sketches here to try to understand the, the, their place. We left the students semi-autonomous, presenting them only with the two GIS map. And then we wanted them to live, to be free to develop their own tools and methodology. So they had like one night on one day to do this urban analysis. Then they go through the sensitive analysis. Here again, each group did his or her its uh, own methodology. For example, the first group question perceptions and ask passerby about their appreciation of the place at night through three questions. Do you pass by here at night? Do you like the atmosphere of the place and why? And do you think the trail needs a light installation? If so, which one? And they did some statistics about these questions and take to, sorry, the comments of the passerby. The second group engages, engaged a process of surveying the passerby they meet and they extract six representations. The first one, this is a shortcut. It must be hard for a girl. If I were a girl, I wouldn't go that way. Nice dim lights, it's a quiet place. It reminds me a little of Parisian Montmartre, etc., etc. What we can see here is the gender issue is still very strong. And the atmosphere are observed in a very personal way, which underlines for us the relatively individual character of cultural representation of nighttime space. The third group develops also a questionnaire, which includes the following indicators the frequency of passage, the rating of the atmosphere of the place, of the lighting, of the cleanliness, of the number of visitors, and the score giving to feeling of safety. As we can see, each rating is below average. And then they ask the passerbys the opinion on the needs for the new facilities in this studied area. And what we can see here is which is expected is equipment, a new dynamism, a meeting place, or a continuity with nearby spaces. And then the last, the last group, sorry, tried to do some questionnaire to passerby, but they met absolutely no people, so they skip this uh, sensitive analysis with people. And then with this urban analysis and sensitive analysis. They go, they go through the last step, which is contextualized atmospheres. On here, again, we have four propositions. The first one is a nighttime lighting design to support cycling and walking, to offer punctual contemplative points of view towards the Loire on its surroundings, with the installation of luminous pole whose dimensions reduces as the itinerary progresses. On here, the, the question which appears is, could we guide the nighttime pathways in a different way than with lighting? Because the purpose of the workshop is rediscovering darkness. So is installing street lighting is efficient in this um, project of rede rediscovering darkness. The second group proposed also a nighttime lighting design to enhance the vegetation with light and to preserve the biodiversity with photometric criteria among the most respectful of the environment. Here, we, we, we were a bit uh, surprised and we asked them if the illuminating the vegetation was still an option because we thought that uh, we could go through this kind of uh, uh, mise en valeur uh, with the light of the uh, of the vegetation. 
The third group proposed an approach designed for use for over 24 hours to respond to the need in terms of activities and dynamism and to propose an area for free sport practices. Here, the wonder is, is the design proposition compatible with the current nighttime use of the area? And then the last group propose is the only one to propose the installation of a bench type furniture to just contemplate the exi existing night landscape and to preserve the current darkness of the chosen seat. This open a new topic like, can we imagine safe spots to enjoy the darkness on the surrounding nightscape without putting more street lighting or more artificial lighting in a place. And to just build a huge bench to watch the city in a panoramic view from a dark point. So in conclusion to the three questions, how to discuss nighttime space in French architecture and design studies, we think that Approaching nocturnal space time through field experience allows for an immersive approach, but is too short to, to prevent and prevents a deeper historical and theoretical understanding. So we think it is necessary to imagine a longer formation. How do architecture and design students deal with nighttime space in a design project? We found in this precise case that students easily assimilate the tools and methodology of nocturnal field work, but the project they imagine are within the existing cultural path of the nighttime illuminated space. There is a need, we think, for a formation about nighttime space with darkness. And then this is the last question, how could we bring the notion of nighttime space into architecture and design studies in France. And then we explore the notion of dark design, explored by Dune, Nick Dune, uh, that should be a part of the full cycle of architecture and design education. And this opened the main question, how could we, how could we teach darkness? And this is the end, thank you very much.